I study race and racism on a very regular basis, and it's a very strange area to study because it seems like everybody has an opinion about it, and no one actually knows what they're talking about. Oh, so you do know what you're talking about when it comes to race and racism, subjects that you study on a regular basis. Therefore, you are enlightened on those subjects and everyone else is just a poser. Got it. Um, there's a, and, and actually, sometimes the people who have the, hard, the strongest opinions actually know the least about what they're talking about. Yes. So, unlike all of those other people, you are special. Got it. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to advance a, a, a new concept. Uh, for you and also take you sort of on my intellectual journey coming to this point. And the concept is called white immunity. White immunity. Well now, I will admit that is not a concept that I have heard of before. So you're reaching for the coattails of someone like Robin D'Angelo, who coined the phrase white fragility and who has made a very lucrative career of selling the idea to white people that they should all bow their heads whenever anyone calls white people out for their skin color. All right, well, I am ready to be educated. Please do sell me, <laughs> I mean, tell me all about white immunity. And it's actually a very simple concept. It's that uh, white people, by virtue of being in a racist society, receive kind of a social inoculation from racial oppression. Uh, okay. So, if I am understanding you correctly, you are taking a single white privilege, that of not being subject to the travails of racism, and turning it into its own unique concept with its own unique name. So, white immunity means immunity from being the victim of racism as a result of being white. Thus, you are assuming that someone possesses certain advantages in life based wholly on their skin color. And that is a belief which, in and of itself, is not at all racist. Got it. And how I started developing this was off of a lot of discussions about white privilege. You don't say. And kind of ironically, my, the, the first uh, jumping off point into this uh, came from uh, the conservative commentator Bill O'Reilly. Um, I watched the O'Reilly Factor on a fairly regular basis when it was on because I like having high blood pressure. Um, <laughs> Uh huh. And how was it ironic to come up with this idea while watching Bill O'Reilly? Is it because he's white? I'm not sure that word means what you think it means, which is uh, kind of ironic. And he had, uh, he, whenever white privilege comes up, he loves railing against it. He says, he said, when I was, you know, working class, painting houses in Carville, I didn't have white privilege. I'm going to have to exempt myself. Now, first of all, it's the epitome of white privilege to say you don't have white privilege like that, but that's a different issue altogether. Yes. The more that you deny being a witch is just more proof that you are a witch. Got it. But I started thinking about this. I said, well, you know, what, what kind of a mental image does white privilege uh, create in our heads? 
Now, this is where I originally had a bit from Saturday Night Live starring Eddie Murphy posing as a white man in a classic skit, but NBC didn't like the fact that I used that very brief clip in a completely fair use context, so now you get to listen to me explain to you what you would have seen if I hadn't been blocked and copyright struck. But moving on. And it, just the term privilege, it, it, it's, it invokes this kind of, you know, semi-charmed life. It's summertime and the love, uh, living is easy, your daddy's rich and your mom is good looking. And, 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 and then, but then the corollary to that is that if I can therefore find a point in my time, my personal history, my family's history, where we were struggling, I therefore am not privileged. So there's kind of a semantic issue. It was weird. I was kind of agreeing with the semantic issue he was taking, even though, you know, Mr. O'Reilly really doesn't care about white privilege. A semantic issue. So if I can point to objective facts or experiences where my skin color did not indemnify me from hardship or prejudice, those are semantic issues. They are not evidence that contradicts your claim that white people are immune to such things. Got it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, just the framing of it, I didn't have white privilege. It removes it, race. It individualizes race. And it individualizes racism. And, and all too often, that's how we have counterproductive conversations about racism. It's sort of on this, like, you know, on, the, on this Likert scale. You're a good person. You're not really racist. You, you a little bit. You, oh God, you're so racist. Don't, you know, it, but it, it's it's all about the individual, and that's not how racism operates. Racism, an ideology of racial supremacy and or inferiority, does not operate on an individual basis of action or belief. Got it. And so, and that gets lost in a lot of white privilege conversations. And so to go back, we just have to start off with the idea of what is racism. And I love the deceptively simple definition that the esteemed uh, psychologist Beverly Daniel Tatum gives, where she says that it's a system of advantage based upon race, where in her estimation, white people are at the advantage, are at the top of the social ladder. So this one woman's redefinition of what racism is wherein racism is not about the elevation and or denigration of people on the basis of race, but is rather a theory that assumes the supremacy of white people in all things, thus making white people inherent villains and everyone else inherent victims, this is the definition of racism that you have chosen to go with. Got it. And the reason why I like that is that it makes it a systemic analysis. So, by making up a false definition for a word, you can then extend that into a faulty analysis of reality. Got it. And so then, um, you know, the, 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 the overall question I get is, well, what does that mean? What does a system mean? And there's a very simple analogy, sort of like the SAT analogies, this is to this, this is to this. That we, can, uh, that we can use, and that is capitalism. Uh, what? All too often we think that racism is only sponsored by racists. No, no, no. By the corollary, uh, capitalism is not just held up by people of a capitalist class. Anytime you gas up your car, anytime you get your groceries, anytime that happens, you're participating in the economic system that we have in the society. And so therefore, racism becomes a question of what do your actions do in relationship to the systemic reality? Participation in capitalism, an economic system, equates to participation in racism, an ideology of discrimination based on skin color. Got it. So having said that, in order to really understand white immunity, though, we kind of have to go into the formation of whiteness in this country. This is going to sound kind of weird. You sound weird? Nah. But learning about whiteness in this country is a really, really, really fascinating issue because it's one of the social identities that it has a very unique way that it came about. 
because when, uh, uh, when European settlers were coming over and stealing land from the Native Americans uh, and, and killing them on the spot. European settlers came to steal the land of the Native Americans and killing them on the spot. Well, thank you for that very oversimplified Reader's Digest version of history. That the, they weren't known as white. They were known by their country of origin. They were known as Irish and, and Germans and, Pol and all this stuff. And, and, and the idea of whiteness didn't really exist, but there was kind of a watershed moment uh, around Bacon's rebellion. Uh, but it, in, in, I don't want to say that it was just episodic, like this just sort of materialized. This was, you know, decades and hundreds of years of, of, of constant action. So, wait a second. Are you explaining to us that it is possible to be racist against white people? That back when people were thought of first and foremost as Irish or Polish or Italian, that their skin color did not protect them from being discriminated against? Well, go on. Where the ruling elite in society started realizing we cannot keep poor whites out of the system anymore. If they form coalitions, with free blacks, Native Americans, whoever, they could overthrow the existing rules. So they started saying, okay, you know what? We're gonna give you token incorporation into our society. We'll, we'll put you on slave patrols, we'll make you overseers. You're not gonna be rich, but at least you're gonna have a little bit of skin in the game. Skin in the game. I see what you did there. At the same time, there was a consistent articulation of the ideology that being of European descent was inherently superior, that Europeans were a superior race. Likely because of their relative advancements in art, science, technology, etc., as compared to the tribal natives that they encountered. Of course, they were also operating on a Dark Ages understanding of the connection between, and the capabilities of, human beings, regardless of their appearance. You know, I'm always fascinated by the application of notions that are hundreds of years stale being spoken of as if they actively applied in the modern day. And what this did is it created what the esteemed sociologist W.B. Du Bois referred to as the public and psychological wages of whiteness. I may be tired, I may be downtrodden, I may not be rich, but at least I'm not black. And that idea of assuming a thought process and value system inherent to people based solely on their skin color, that idea, in and of itself, is not racist. Got it. And some of you are kind of giving me this furled look in your eyes right now, and, and, and if it doesn't make sense, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point, because race and racism was never meant to make sense. If you look at what has happened as a result of systemic racism and white supremacy in our history, the genocide and theft of native lands, the enslavement of, native, of, 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 of Africans, the, the uh, making Chinese uh, do the railroad, the theft of Mexico, I mean, it's not pretty. <laughs> okay, our speaker has mastered the art of understatement. But, um, just a question. Are you telling us that Africans never stole land from other Africans or participated in the slave trade? Are you telling us that Native Americans never tried to wipe out entire rival tribes and then take their women as slaves? The nature of human history is not pretty regardless of the skin color or national origin of the individuals involved. Are you going to hold modern-day Native Americans accountable for the atrocities of their ancestors? Are you going to confront a random black person on the street about the sins of their long-dead African ancestors on the Barbary Coast? I take neither credit or blame for things that I have not done. Nor do I hold anyone aloft or beneath me for the very same reasons. Our speaker does not operate on a similar principle, apparently. Well, at least when it comes to a 
particular skin color. It's not meant to make sense. It's almost like you do these dehumanizing actions and you come up with a racist uh, idea after the fact. So if what I'm saying doesn't make sense, that's exactly the point of racism. It's not supposed to make sense. You are correct. It does not make sense. Which makes me wonder why you are promoting it. But last but not least, in terms of, of whiteness formation, law played a critical role. Ah, yes, the law. Please do tell us all about the laws we operate under today that indemnify white people from hardship or discrimination based on their skin color. And then, please tell me how it is that you are standing on a stage in public denigrating white people. And it did so by saying, okay, we have the Constitution. It says that all men are created equal. And yes, it was male-specific. All right, well, whatever Jefferson's actual intentions in using that phrase at the time, the words all men have since evolved into common understanding to refer to all human beings. Because, you know, our laws and the interpretations thereof have evolved and changed over time along with our society. I really wonder if our speaker understands that. Or does he think that long defunct and overwritten rules about race are in active practice today? So there are these inalienable rights that everybody is supposed to have. And then laws started forming in the United States that eliminated rights for people of color. Rights to own land, rights to read, rights to intermarry, rights to travel. I mean, and what ended up happening was you had this core at the center where rights were allowed, and then all of a sudden this group's denied, this group's denied, this group's denied, and you created this thing by, from whiteness, uh, called whiteness by, eliminating, by identifying people who were not white. It was this, ident this idea of definition through negation. Yes, indeed, it is true. But tell us, are those laws still in place today, or aren't they? And so basically it was necessarily creating a white supremacist society that denied rights to people of color, and that was a foundational component of our history. And then that relates back to white immunity because, again, we're talking about base standards of human rights, and so the disparate racial oppression that people of color were experiencing, white people had that social inoculation to. Uh-huh. And this is as true today as it was hundreds of years ago. Is, is that what I am to understand? So then a lot of people will say, well, weren't the 60s a really important time? And absolutely they were. They were an incredibly important time. But... But let's not kid ourselves to think that you can have several hundred years of overt white supremacist thought, action, law, ingraining in every sector, uh, sector of our society, and then you're going to undo that in 10 years. 10 years. Well, the last I checked, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law in 1964. So it's actually been over half a century, nearly two generations of Americans who have been born and who have grown up with the values of the civil rights movement having already reshaped our society. Oh, but obviously, none of that really matters, because since history is immutable, our present hasn't actually advanced past it. Got it. It was incredibly important that people of marginalized racial identities were able to affirm their own humanity in the 1960s. But... But that doesn't mean we completely overthrow the system. As a matter of fact, what, usually, what a lot of sociologists now argue is that racism as a system was then driven underground. Racism as a system was driven underground. Well, rest assured, 
If you have given any attention to diversity and inclusion initiatives within businesses and other institutions, then you'll know that racism, as a system, is anything but underground. A really simple example of this, because we talk about race all the time, but we don't actually talk about race, is the comedian Daniel Tosh asked, uh, was, was doing a stand-up, his first stand-up uh, at uh, Comedy Central, and he said, you ever notice when they say this place is really safe, they mean it's really segregated? And there was just crickets in the audience. And he says, did that cut a little too close to Comb Orange County? <laughs> and the beautiful thing about that joke is that it's, it, it's a joke mad lib. I can do that anywhere, right? Right. I could be here and say, hey, does that cut a little too close to home, Catalina Foothills? Oh, exactly, and people are uncomfortable with that, absolutely. So what if they had laughed? Would that have made your accusation more or less valid in your mind? And is the lack of laughter an admission of truth? or an absence of considering the concepts of safety and segregation as synonymous. Do you always take an audience's confusion as affirmation? But we talk about race all the time. One piece of audience participation, help me out. What's known as the dangerous side of Tucson? You racist, mo no. <laughs> but the point is that we have heard this constantly. And it's not coincidental that the good side of town, the safe side of town, also corresponds to the white side of town. The dangerous side of town happens to be the brown side of town. Okay, well, I always took the phrase the wrong side of the tracks to refer to class rather than race. But, hey, you keep going with your totally not racist self. And the question that I ask you as you reflect on these words a little bit is this. As much as you have heard that the South Side is dangerous, how many people have actually looked up the crime statistics? How many people have actually gone and seen, is this really a dangerous neighborhood? Quote, The overall crime rate in South Tucson is 57% higher than the national average. Unquote. Quote, On a scale of one, low crime, to 100, high crime, South Tucson violent crime is 91.8. The U.S. average is 31.1. South Tucson property crime is 98.8. The U.S. average is 38.1. Unquote. I'm not making an argument one way or another. I'm making a point that we do this based upon sort of just this assumption that if it's a largely Latino neighborhood, if it's a largely black neighborhood, that it's going to be dangerous. No. Stop. You are making an argument. You are arguing that your audience is incorrect about the crime rates of a local neighborhood because they are being inherently racist. When in fact, that neighborhood is a high crime area and not a safe place to be. There is indeed someone at this TEDx talk that is making broad assumptions about the character of people based on their skin color. And he is standing in a red circle. But again, that's how race infects itself into our consciousness without us even realizing it. I wonder if our speaker would as well accept that maybe, just maybe, he is not aware of his own racism. And so this happens all the time where, you know, people will say things like, you know, not to be a racist, but not to be racially offensive, but not to be racially insensitive, but and almost without fail, after you say that something racist is going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> well, it could be. It could also be the opener to a joke, I guess. It all depends on the context. Oh, but I forgot. Context doesn't matter so long as ancient history remains true and bad.
got it. And so it's, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that racism is very, very much alive today. And there's a massive continuity with the racism of the past. And there's a massive continuity with the racism of the past. You really need us to believe that, don't you? It makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable having that linkage to the past because that also means that the name of the system that we're living under is white supremacy. And again, we've been taught to say that, well, it, that's only supported by white supremacists and those evil guys over in uh, Charlottesville. That's not relevant here and now. White supremacists, actual white supremacists, are not relevant to white supremacy here and now. Got it. And I, I, whenever I use that term on stage, especially when talking about contemporary society, I can feel there's like this tension, like people just kind of, uh, they just, they get a little bit nervous about it. And I ask you to sit with that tension a little bit and just understand that it is more difficult for people of color to survive and thrive in a white supremacist regime than it is for you to feel uncomfortable with the terminology. A white supremacist regime. That is what we live under. Got it. But also, is it the terminology that you're using? Or is it your implicit accusation of inherent racism that makes people uncomfortable? Do you always take your audience's discomfort as affirmation? From a sociological perspective, it is accurate. And so that's what I'm asking you, is to look within yourself if you are feeling uncomfortable with that. From a sociological perspective, it is accurate. It is accurate that your audience's discomfort over being accused of passive racism should be a source of shame when comparing that to the inherent disability possessed by anyone who is not white. It is accurate that we exist under a white supremacist regime. From a sociological perspective, it is accurate. Got it. Having said that, coming back to the issue of white immunity, part of the reason why I really offer it is that white privilege f centers white people. You don't say. People are constantly saying, how am I privileged? How am I privileged? And instead, white immunity actually says, how is my experience markedly different than people of color? How is my individual experience different from all other people of color? Is that really the question that you are asking? It's asking you to say, what is going on that's outside of my experience? What have I been blinded to because of the social inoculation? So, a white person must imagine that whatever their own personal circumstances, anyone who is not white has it worse off because they are not white. Because being white is an inherent advantage, and not being white is an inherent disadvantage. And by this thinking, we will reduce racism in this country. Got it. So instead of centering white privilege, it makes you actually look holistically at society and how it is that we're treating the most marginalized. We. We as in white people? Or is our speaker also including himself, I wonder? It requires us to have a sense of empathy. Uh-oh, there's my favorite word. Empathy. One of the foundationary impulses of human civilization. Which, of course, of course, you do not possess unless you agree with whatever our speaker says. Because, well, you wouldn't want to be considered inhuman, would you? A sense of linked fate to say that my success and my ability to thrive is predicated upon yours as well. And I use empathy in particular because I can't stand sympathy. 
Sympathy all too often is feeling sorry for somebody, looking down on somebody. So you equate feeling sorry for someone as looking down on that person. Got it. I want to be co-collaborators. I want empathy. I want to see us for our mutual humanity. At the same time, white privilege has devolved into almost this, like, well, what do you do with it? What do I do with what? White privilege? Or empathy? Or sympathy? I'm, I'm confused. And my confusion affirms whatever our speaker is saying. And all too often it becomes, well, I will confess my white privilege. This is how I was privileged in this one situation. But all that that is, it's, it's just basically helping alleviate white guilt. It's saying, I am, have white guilt, I have confessed my white sins, and I am blessed and go with God. It's like, no, I am not your racial priest. Really? Well, you certainly sound like a leader of a racial inquisition. So, you want everyone to acknowledge their white privilege, that white people are just inherently better off than non-white people, but in acknowledging one's white privilege, well, that's just an attempt to dispel one's white guilt, which one should have if they are white. And you can never get rid of your white privilege, or your white guilt, because, well, you know, you're white. Oh, but our speaker isn't a racial priest, and he isn't delivering the good word that being white is an original sin. No, not at all. I have no patience for guilt and I have no patience for sympathy. If you want to actually do something with it, then do something with it. But don't turn the emotions around to make it so that you recenter whiteness in the process. That, um, that didn't make any sense. Oh, wait, I forgot. Race and racism was never meant to make sense. Ultimately, though, I go into the history of white supremacy and link it to our contemporary times in my offering of white immunity because... Because it's easier to hold people accountable today for things they had nothing to do with and cannot change? It all too often is seen that, that you can, you know, I can undo white privilege or I can give up my privilege. No, no, no. The only way that we get away from white immunity is to dismantle white supremacy. But being white is inherently advantageous, as you've told us over and over again. I mean, there's hundreds of years of things that have happened that help to lead up to there being homeless white people and a billionaire like Jay-Z. So, do tell us, how do we dismantle white supremacy in the face of white immunity. And so, when I see racial lectures on race and racism, I see them a lot. Heck, I give them a lot. Wow. It's almost like you've made a name for yourself on the basis of racism. Funny, that. They end in some sort of, uh, you know, now here's an interesting thought, take my 10-point racial plan, Here's how you do anti-racism in three quick and easy steps. Um, and I obviously would love for you to engage with this concept, develop this concept, figure out how to put this concept into practice. Uh, put what concept into practice? The concept of white immunity? I mean... You want white people to feel impervious to racial discrimination? Or do you want white people to dismantle white supremacy? But not by confessing their white privilege, or with the use of sympathy, because that's just not good enough. I can't stand sympathy. Okay, I'm, I'm confused. And my confusion affirms what our speaker is saying. But ultimately, I want to be very clear about one thing. 
And that is whether we're talking about white privilege or white immunity, we're talking about racism 101. Well, now that I can agree with you on. Because assigning a value to people on the basis of their skin color, that is indeed racism 101. We're talking about the mathematical equivalent of addition when it comes to racial conversations. And collectively, we need to be at a calculus level. Oh, uh, what? And so instead of sitting here and saying, the end, that's great, we're all gravy, I want you to feel a little unsettled by this. I want you to feel a little uneasy by this. You want us all to feel a little ashamed by this? Maybe. And instead of saying, okay, as long as I take account of white immunity, everything's good, see white immunity as a jumping off point. Off a cliff, maybe. And so instead of saying the end, my challenge to you is here's to a beginning. Thank you. A new beginning. Wow. So profound, so thought-provoking, so utter and complete nonsense. But then, our speaker did warn us, Race and racism was never meant to make sense. And in that, at least, he was telling us the truth. But hey, what do I know? I mean, I am white. As always, thank you for watching.